Hello lovelies and happy new year. 2023 is out and 2024 is in. To be honest, New Year's Eve is one of my least favorite holidays. Something about watching a year end and then watching a new one begin gives me an uneasy feeling of existential dread. But I hope you all had a good one. To kick off the new year, we're gonna talk about aliens, specifically the 2009 film, The Fourth Kind. I didn't see this movie when it came out. I watched it later in 2016 because I was telling a friend of mine a personal potential supernatural experience I had when I was a child and it freaked her out so much that she was like, have you seen the fourth kind? I have avoided alien movies since fifth grade when I saw signs and was traumatized for life and aliens became the single most scariest thing I could possibly think of. And she was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Um, maybe you should watch the fourth kind. There's a few things in your story that are lining up and it's freaking me out. Oh, okay, well, fuck. I, I guess I'll watch it. I've avoided alien abduction encounter movies ever since I saw Signs in the fifth grade. Signs is terrifying, I don't care what you say. My brother convinced me it wasn't even a horror movie. I've only seen it the one time and I could tell you almost every detail of it. That's the level of imprint it left in my, in my head. It made me unreasonably afraid of aliens. Like unreasonably terrified. It became the number one thing to go bump in the night for me. Which is a shame because I loved movies like Muppets from space. Protecting the Earth from the scum of the universe. I was really into space as a kid and signs made me terrified of space. I was never afraid of aliens because before they are always cute little monster type guys. Monsters in movies just didn't scare me as a kid. Anthropomorphic creatures scared me as a kid. That gives me uncanny valley. But you whip out these alien monsters and I'm fine. I'm cool as a cucumber. I'm sitting pretty. I'm chilling. And to this day, Alien is one of my top favorite movies of all time. <laughs> So why are movies like The Thing and Killer Clowns okay? Well, I don't exactly plan to go to Antarctica anytime soon, and uh, I like clowns. So what was my potential alien encounter that inspired my friend to force me to watch the fourth kind? Well, the first one happened when I was seven years old in the year 2000. I was afraid of the dark and was trying to combat that fear by forcing myself to sleep in the dark. Even though it terrified me because I'm brave, okay? One night I was trying to sleep and I heard something small hit my window. And of course it scared me because I was trying to fall asleep. And then I heard it again. I was like, I don't like this. And I decided to slowly turn to look at my window to see if there was anything there. And there was nothing there. So I had decided that the noise was little squirrel friends throwing an acorn to play a prank at me. Then I remembered that there is a owl that lives in front of my window in a tree. I typically can't see it from my window. I know he's there though because I hear him hooting. He goes, hoo hoo Pretty sure it was a great horned owl. So I fell asleep feeling fine thinking about my new animal friends who were just trying to be friends and hang out with me so I could not go to sleep terrified. Well, I woke up in the middle of the night terrified. <laughs> I just woke up in a cold sweat and I was so scared that adrenaline was pumping you get from a nightmare, but I couldn't remember anything. I couldn't remember the nightmare. I just know that I woke up scared. So I turned on my disco light, night light. I was on my bed stand. It was just a disco ball light I used as a bedside table light, <laughs> which we should bring those back. Maybe I'll link one below so we can all bring back the super cool mini disco balls of the 2000s. So I calmed myself down and I managed to go to sleep, but this time with my disco ball light on. My mom had woken me up for school and as I got up to get dressed, I noticed my window was open. So that scared the shit out of me. <laughs> but then I remembered my bedroom was on the second floor. So I ran downstairs and I asked my entire family, did anybody open the window? And they were all like, no, nobody went into your room and nobody opened the window. And I was like, ah, okay. And I decided to just forget that the whole thing ever happened. So the second encounter was when I was 15 years old, 2008. Same, I was trying to go to sleep. I had just laid down, closed my eyes, and that's when I experienced sleep paralysis. Now, the only other time I had experienced sleep paralysis prior to this was when I was five, and my sleep paralysis isn't 
like your typical sleep paralysis person, my eyes and my eyelids become paralyzed too. Like when I feel sleep paralysis, my eyelids do not open. But I also never feel a presence in the room the way other people seem to. But this was alarming because it was the second time that it had ever happened to me. I don't know how else to describe this, but it felt like two invisible hands, like not fully, it, like imagine feeling the impression of a hand on your face. It doesn't feel solid, you just feel the pressure, which is a scary feeling. It kind of, it feels like a ghost, like a ghost grabbing your face, I guess. Wasn't pleased with that sensation. There was just this bright light, so I could just see red, the inside of my eyelids, and I could see that there was a light. What the fuck? The ghost has a flashlight. I was so scared that I told myself I was gonna count backwards from 10, and when I was done, I wasn't gonna be paralyzed anymore. It was all gonna be over. I was gonna be able to to get up and move. So I did. I counted down from 10 and once I got to one, my eyes shot open. I sat up immediately. There was nothing in the room. Then all of a sudden, my bed like rolled. Imagine a giant rolling pin going under your mattress being pulled back towards you. So my body went up like a wave. Like I was sitting there like, ooh. <laughs> I started screaming at that point and I ran out of the room just screaming. Really? I slept in the guest bedroom that night and once again nothing like that has ever happened to me ever since I'm 31 years old now so it's been over 15 years so um I guess the details about the owl the sleep paralysis the bright light, the memory loss from waking up terrified, the window being open. I guess all of these details made her freak out and immediately think that I should watch The Fourth Kind because she believed that it was real and based on a true story because that's how it's advertised. Let's find out if it is. And let's find out just how close I might have been to aliens as a child. Mia Jokovic gives the most dramatic opening to any movie I have ever seen. I am actress Mila Jovovich, and I will be portraying Dr. Abigail Tyler in The Fourth Kind. This film is a dramatization of events that occurred October 1st through the 9th of 2000. Really trying to set you up to believe this story you're about to witness is not only real, but includes real footage of the actual victims. They go so far as to show the side-by-side -side comparison of the real event and the dramatization done by the paid actors. They start with a Chapman University interview with the real Abigail Tyler, and it bleeds into Mia's portrayal of her. She's a psychologist living in Nome, Alaska, a town so small and remote you can't even drive into it, you have to fly. Also a town that ever since the 1960s seems to have a high number of mysterious disappearances. Not only is she a psychologist, but she practices hypnotherapy on her patients to try and help them recover repressed memories. She herself undergoes this treatment to try to help her remember the face of the man who killed her husband. She seems to be able to remember the event, but not the culprit. Pretty soon, we learn that Abby's patients all seem to be experiencing the same weird phenomena. It was an owl. A what owl? No matter what I did, it wouldn't fly away. An owl stares at them outside of their window. It gets inside somehow, continues to observe them. They wake up around 3 a.m., but all of their memories are too hazy to really recall what actually happened. When they undergo hypnotherapy, they all exclaim, it's not an owl. At home, we learn Abby's kids are not coping so well with the death of their father. The daughter experiences unexplained complete blindness in her eyes, and the son copes by being a total asshole to his mom. And who are you playing again? I already told you, Browerville. Oh, I'm sorry, sweetie, I must have forgot. Dad never forgot. It's kids like this that just make me want to never consider having kids. And Dad's not here anymore. Can you accept it yet? He's such a little shit. Turns out Abby's late husband, Will, was also a psychologist, and they were both researching something together that was of great importance to both of them. Will's most recent research is now leading Abby to Dr. Awaloa Arusami, 
a researcher who has dedicated his career to studying the ancient language Sumerian. In a recording of Will Tyler, we learn that not just a couple people are suffering the same weird insomnia symptoms, but over 300 people in Nomar. It seems he's trying to find a way to connect this phenomena to all the missing people and disappearances that seem to be happening around town. Tommy is the first of Abby's patients who isn't mentally capable of dealing with remembering what really happens late at night when he goes to sleep and ends up murder-suiciding his entire family in what he believes to be an act of mercy. He asks for Abby to show up, and the sheriff has decided this means she is responsible for the entire situation. You know, because every time someone commits murder or suicide, it's their therapist's fault. I don't know about no mumbo-jumbo science mind talk. All I know is a man was alive, and now he is dead. I don't like doing investigations. I like jumping to conclusions. Your brain made his brain all crazy lack, or something like that. I'm just wondering that without this hypnotism, do you think he still would have murdered his family? She falls asleep talking to herself, and the next day learns the recording picked up a little more than she had thought. Do the others feel the same way? <laughs> Strange marks on her body and scratches on the floor are enough for her to confirm she was abducted last night. Secondary. Oh, I didn't like that. Something moved over there and neither of my cats are over there. I don't like that. There's a secondary voice on the tape besides her screaming that is some mysterious vocaloid. <laughs> She learns the mystery language on the tape is actually Sumerian and she gets help from Dr. Arasami with translations. Clearly having no appreciation for vocaloid music, uh, she is freaked out by the secondary voice on the tape. The vocals, they don't sound um, ordinary. Human. And her other psychologist friend, Abel flies in to help confirm if she's insane or not. Her second patient, Scott, also wants to undergo hypnosis to figure out what the fuck was up with that owl. And that just doesn't go well. Time to flee the state before the police find out what happened. Naturally, her son, Ronnie, is just absolutely no help. What did you do? He's such a little shit. He's paralyzed from the neck down. Three of the vertebrae in his neck are completely severed. Oops. Luckily, Abel is there to help corroborate her story, and she gets away with just a mild house arrest for the night. So now is a great time for the movie to explain its title to us. An alien encounter of the first kind is seeing a UFO. An alien encounter of the second kind is evidence of a UFO, like crop circles or radiation. We're going to ignore the fact that crop circles have been debunked and move on. The third kind is when you make contact, and the fourth kind is when they abduct you. Joke's on her though, almost immediately after she was put on house arrest, the UFOs show up to phase her daughter through the ceiling and take her away, and the whole thing was witnessed by a police officer watching the house. Naturally, the sheriff doesn't want to ask the cop what happened and just wants to go straight to blaming Abby. Abby! Where is she, goddammit? You tell me where she is! And Ronnie continues to be my reason for never wanting children. Mom! Can't you stop? Stop what, kid? Like, what is it that he thinks she's doing? I'm removing him from your custody. Good. Good. They should take Ronnie. No, no, baby, baby, no, no. He clearly doesn't want to be there, and he sure as hell doesn't want to be raised by his mother. Fucking take that kid. Not once did he say anything empathetic, kind, or supportive to his mother, knowing her husband recently died. And he seems to be a smart enough kid to see that she's really fucking struggling with that. But no, it's all about dad would remember if I had a fucking sports game. I get that kids are shit, but like, come on. Abby has now decided to try to purposefully get abducted by aliens to get Ashley back. It halfway works. She gets abducted along with Abel and Awaloa. However, it accomplishes nothing except more physical and mental trauma for all of them. 
but mostly for Abby. Abby is hospitalized from her hypnosis session, broke her neck or her back possibly. It's revealed that her husband shot himself in the head and she admits that she made up the fact that he was murdered instead of committing suicide as a coping mechanism. Your credibility, how do you expect me or the audience to believe anything you're saying. She says not only are the tapes evidence of her story, but she personally has to keep hope alive so she can believe Ashley is safe and alive because Ashley was never found. It's revealed that Abby is now handicapped and bound to a wheelchair from her hypnosis and abduction injuries. The ending is the unnamed Chapman interviewer and Mia Yokovich telling us how often the FBI vacays in Alaska. And what is up with the blue spinning forest in the background? Was the director just really inspired by Twilight? You better hold on tight, spider monkey. And because we would hate to break 2000s movie tradition, we of course have our ending title card statements. But not just any ending title card statements telling us where all the characters are now, it is the single longest title card statement sequence I have ever seen to the point to where it's comical. Dr. Abel Campos continues to practice psychology in Alaska. He refused to comment and participation in this film. Love when a movie gets grammar wrong. It should be participate. Dr. Oaloa Adesami has since attained tenure at a prestigious Canadian university. Okay. He assisted with the Sumerian translations, though declined any further involvement. He corroborates Dr. Tyler's testimony, which her testimony includes that he did have further involvement. They were abducted together, which has got to be like some sort of ultimate bonding event. Sheriff August retired two years after the incident and currently resides in northern Alaska. He rejected any and all involvement in this film. Now 22 years old, Ronnie Tyler remains estranged from Dr. Tyler. Not surprising. He continues to blame her for Ashley's disappearance. Unreasonable. She has since relocated to the east coast of the U.S. Due to her deteriorating condition, she remains bedridden under constant medical supervision. This shit just keeps going. <laughs> she continues to assert that Ashley was taken by non-human intelligences. Ashley has never been found. The credits roll and we hear recordings of real phone calls people made to the UFO Report Center, which I didn't know existed. I should have known there was an official UFO Report Center, but I just didn't know there was an official UFO Report Center. Wow. 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 That was a movie. My favorite part is when all the characters were so insufferable that it actually made it difficult for me to finish. Okay, well, Dr. Adesami, he was chill. That's about it. So I guess it's time for me to tell you all about the real Dr. Abigail and just how closely and accurately this movie used the archive footage from real life to depict the real events that happened in this film. Abigail Tyler was born in the year never. She never existed. None of this ever happened, and the entire story is completely fabricated. They're all actors. Like, they're all actors, which my first thought when I learned this was, why? What was the point? What is the point of having this side-by-side -side comparison of the archived footage and the reenactment footage next to each other? What's the fucking point of that if everybody is just a paid actor? It just takes away anything interesting or entertaining about this movie and it actually makes the movie like incredibly boring to watch once you know it's not real it doesn't play off as artistic or anything fun it just plays off as hokey and lame like unfortunately the did they just want to film a movie twice and compare it to itself so what is this like mila jokovic playing a version of herself that just really likes aliens is just really invested in aliens. It doesn't read like you're you're playing a bit of yourself. It reads like you're just lying to people. This actually would have been a much better movie if it was just another found footage film. Two years prior, Paranormal Activity came out. That was a success and everybody knew that that was fake. So like, why couldn't they just do a found footage alien movie? Like, why did they have to add this weird reenactment pseudo-documentary part? I don't understand. <laughs> 
absolutely nothing in this movie is real to the point to where Gnome Alaska complained about it. The only details this movie got correct is that people have gone missing in Gnome Alaska. And it is in fact difficult to travel there. Just ask Balto. <laughs> the Balto movie is more accurate than this movie was. <laughs> The fourth kind wasn't even filmed in Nome, Alaska. It was filmed in the Balkan Mountains of Bulgaria. I was in high school when this movie came out and I do remember believing it was real. I didn't see it, but I do remember Googling if it was real and I do remember articles popping up saying, yes, it is real. Yes, Nome, Alaska has had so many disappearances and hot spot for UFO sightings and aliens. And, and I, I remember that. And now if you Google it, none of that comes up. What the hell is that about? Well, I found out what it was about. They created fake articles to promote the movie. Yes, Universal created fake news articles about aliens in Nome, Alaska to advertise. When you think about previous gimmicks for movies, especially the Blair Witch, people are like, oh, that should be harmless. Except it's not because they had these news articles published in real fucking newspapers. It wasn't like Blair Witch where there was an isolated website. It was in a real fucking newspaper that people read for real news. The Gnome Nugget being one of them and being furious over it. Nugget publisher Nancy McGuire freaked out because an article she did not write was somehow on her website. She called the website and demanded it to be taken down. They were just super unconcerned, I guess, and didn't bother, so she had to go to the next step and get a lawyer. I really was concerned about it because I didn't write these things. They were using my newspaper to give credibility to those stories. People see it on the internet and they say, oh, it must be true. I sure as fuck did. Now, Gnome does have residents who did mysteriously die and disappear. But all of this false news about aliens being the reason behind that just felt really disrespectful to all of the friends and family of the missing people. The Alaskan Press Club hired Anchorage attorney John McKay to sue Universal for the false news reports and for using real missing persons cases to promote the movie. They won the lawsuit and Universal agreed to pay up and take down all the articles and try to prevent new ones from popping up. But that's easier said than done. Once the internet gets a hold of info, it's pretty hard to wipe it, especially if it's information that sells and that people want to believe. And a lot of people want to believe stuff like this is true. Nancy McGuire even joked that she herself is an alien from Mars. As it turns out, she grew up in Mars, Pennsylvania, which is just north of Pittsburgh before she moved out to Nome, Alaska. Universal paid $20,000 to the Alaskan Press Club, a $2,500 donation to its Callista Scholarship Fund, and made a donation to the Nome Homeless Shelter in Nancy and the Nugget's name. It was a little hard for me to swallow that a town that has less than 4,000 people in it has homeless people, but I guess this is America, isn't it? So why did writer Olatunde Asan Sami pick Nome, Alaska as the setting for his film? He was even in the movie as the interviewer with Chapman University. It is true that 24 people went missing in Nome, Alaska between the years 1960 and 2004. For a town that has a population of roughly 3,500 people, statistically that is too high a number for missing persons. The ratio is off. And in a town like this, everybody knows each other, so it's scary. If someone goes missing, most people are gonna know who that person is, they're gonna talk about it, and it's gonna be big news. Some thought maybe it was animals in the wilderness attacking people who might have wandered off for some reason, and others became afraid that it was maybe a serial killer. And a few people threw out the theory that maybe it was alien abductions. It is said that Alaska is a UFO hotspot, even though in my research, Alaska didn't even make it to the top 10 states of the most sightings of UFOs in the United States, but that doesn't seem to change the fact that there are dozens of videos and articles online of people talking about how Alaska is a UFO hotspot. One of the first ever UFO sightings was in Anchorage in 1947. But if any of you have ever done alien research before like I have, you learn pretty quickly how difficult 
it is to find any information, especially reliable information. They make it tricky to navigate. Part of the alien theory is due to the fact that these missing people started being tallied in the 1960s, a time when America was a little obsessed with space and, well, aliens. UFO sightings are becoming increasingly more popular, but Alaska's official missing persons database only dates back to 1956. They simply don't have missing person records from before that year. Nome, Alaska was founded in 1901. So that means there's about 55 undocumented years of potential missing persons cases. So it's very possible a lot more than 24 people have gone missing within the last century. It's just not recorded. So the 1960s isn't really relevant to when the missing people began. That's just a coincidence because the records for Alaska's missing persons only goes back to 1956. There's also theories surrounding the Alaska Triangle and the 16,000 people who have disappeared in the Alaskan Triangle since 1988. But I'm not going to give you any details about that because Nome is no Nowhere near the Alaskan Triangle. So you can go and watch the Alaska Triangle uh, docu-series yourself if you want to learn more about that. But the mysteries surrounding the Triangle might have been a reason Asusanmi picked Alaska as the setting for his film. Alien theories aside, the number of missing people in Nome warranted an FBI investigation. They were like, okay, this is enough people, we're gonna see what this is. And I think the big fear about a potential serial killer is what really brought the FBI in. Because for a serial killer, 24 victims over the course of like 40 years is a lot. <laughs> The FBI determined that these disappearances were most likely due to bad combination of extreme harsh weather and excessive alcohol consumption. Walking into the local bar, drinking for a few hours, and walking back home might just be a little more difficult than it sounds when you consider the fact that in the winter months, sometimes Nome, Alaska can get as cold as negative 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's pretty intense. I also couldn't find any evidence to suggest that the FBI visited any more than like two times minimum. So the over 2,000 times claim was a bit excessive. So the number one detail in the movie that led me to believe this was real back in 2016 when I watched it was the Chapman University logo. Why did Chapman sign off on that? Olatunde Osunsanmi got his master's degree from Chapman's Dodge College of Film and Media Arts. Universal asked on behalf of Osunsanmi for permission to use their logo. They showed them the already recorded scenes and Mary Platt, the university's communications director, said, It was apparent to us and presented to us that this would be a kind of inside joke and insider tribute to our alumnus for his first nationally released major motion picture. The university's power brokers thought it would be obvious that the film is clearly a scary fun paranormal thriller about aliens and not mistaken for a real documentary. Various universities sign off on using their logos in movies like all the time. I go here. You got into Harvard Law? What, like it's hard? They were like, oh, psh, yeah, sure. I mean, no one's going to watch this and think it's real. And that's where they were wrong. People believed it was real and was contacting Chapman left and right about the validity of the interview, if they have an uncut version of the interview. One person even going so far as to <laughs> criticize their online news archive for not including the important news about the abduction. Luckily, Chapman thought all of this was just really funny and, you know, didn't view it as them being tricked into using their name to sell a false narrative. They literally said you can go to IMDb and immediately just see that the whole thing is fake. These people put in way more effort to find and contact Mary Platt through Chapman University than to just fucking go to IMDb. Like, it's kind of crazy. Now, do I believe in aliens? Yes, I do. Do I believe aliens are abducting people? Maybe, who's to say? Would I prefer to stay blissfully ignorant about whether or not aliens are abducting people for my own peace of mind so I can sleep soundly at night and not worry about it and feel paranoid and scared? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I would like to um, just not think about it ever. <laughs>
Are you scared that you might be someone who is susceptible to being abducted by aliens? Is that something that keeps you awake at night and makes you a little paranoid sometimes and sometimes you don't like talking about aliens because that's just been a fear of yours for like majority of your life at this point? Well, I have a list for you. According to Psychology Today, here are the top five traits alien abductees all have in common. So if you have these traits, you might be susceptible to alien abduction. Regularly experiencing sleep paralysis and hallucinations when waking up. I've only experienced sleep paralysis about five times in my life and I've only experienced one shared morning hallucination with another girl at a sleepover. <laughs> we both hallucinated that we saw a chicken run through the room really quickly. And it was really funny, but we, we both reacted at the same time and was like, Fuck. We got up to investigate how a chicken could be in the house and like surprise there wasn't one. Especially considering we were at a beach house. A tendency to recall false memories. Studies show that many who claim they've been abducted seem to suffer from false memory syndrome. Alien abductees regularly claimed to recall words, items, etc. in memory tests that they had never actually seen before. If this false memory effect can be generalized to autobiographical memories, then individuals who claim to have been abducted by aliens would be twice as likely to falsely remember things that never happened to them. An example test they conducted was showing them words like sour, sugar, bitter, candy. And when asked to remember the words presented, many would include associative words that they didn't actually see, like the word sweet. Sweet is an associative word to sugar, sour, bitter, and candy, but it wasn't actually a word that was said. The test is to see if they just use the power of suggestion to create their own reality from memory. Susceptibility to hypnosis. Because of this, many abductees recall their experiences under hypnosis, where memories can be induced through suggestibility. New Age beliefs. The tendency to accept unusual and non-mainstream ideas. Abductees tend to score are highly on measures of magical ideation and encompass beliefs that surround alternative healing, astrology, and fortune telling. Someone who is open-minded enough to have new age beliefs are more likely to accept that things happening to them would be dismissed by existing scientific knowledge. For example, someone who is very traditionally religious might believe it's not aliens, they're actually being visited by demons or ghosts or something just a little more biblical. Someone who believes in only existing scientific knowledge would excuse their experience, most likely on psychosis. A new age person might be quicker to believe that it's aliens and report it than the other two would. Lastly is familiarity with the cultural narrative of alien abduction. Plain and simple. The more familiar you are with aliens, the more likely they are to abduct you. I am fucked in almost all of these categories. The memory one is a little bit up in the air for me. I do tend to do well with memory tests, especially in video games. I mean, I'm not perfect. I don't remember everything perfectly, and I don't think it happens often enough for people to be like, hey, that never happened. Like, that's not, it's not something I come across often. But my mind isn't perfect. I hope this video helped clear up any misunderstandings about the validity of the fourth kind. It is definitely not based on a true story. I didn't realize the level of how fake it was until I made this video because I never researched it before. And I also hope this video helped you from getting abducted in the future. Tell me what you think in the comments. Let me know if I said any misinformation or if you have any more information you'd like to add. I just realized there are pictures of a little girl at the end who are supposed to be the real Ashley Tyler. Who the hell was that little girl? Who, who was that? I'm so curious now, I should have looked that up. And of course, please continue to suggest horror movies that are based on a true story for me to cover. I'm creating a list and going to start tackling them in my next video. A few of you suggested The Conjuring, so keep a lookout for that. And as always, keep it creepy. Hello. I just hit my light. Hello. Holy shit. No! Ah!